So my task is simply to answer the question, uh, we, you know, is Brexit populism? We had in British journalism, I think, Gabby, it's reasonable to say, a sort of trope that there was a massive populist surge. As Trump puts it, he was going to be five times Brexit, and then he was. Look what he's doing. It's great. But is, it, is, is there a sort of a, a populist surge in the United Kingdom? So let's look at the evidence. And actually, some of the evidence suggests actually there is. I mean, we have a, uh, a, somebody you can't get away from on the news, failed seven times to become a member of parliament, but he's everywhere, and he's friends with uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we have a surge in people who don't normally engage in politics voting, 72% turnout in the general election, lots of older working class people, um, and lots of people who didn't bother voting in 2015, which actually swung it. Uh, so again, maybe, maybe populism is sort of connecting the parts that other, other politics doesn't reach. And we have a number of factors that are uniquely common to both Britain and the United States. Um, the first is that on, in both Britain and America, those who voted for Trump and those who voted for Brexit certainly don't like people like us in this room. We don't like experts. Uh, they don't go to museums. Uh, they come from small towns in both Britain and America. And of course, the strongest correlate in both Britain and America, a very strong correlation with higher education. And if you don't have it, you tended to vote for Trump or for Brexit. And if you do, you tended to vote for Remain. So on that basis, case solved, and we can carry on with the massive surge that uh, Nigel Farage keeps telling us is going to sweep across Europe and the rest of the world. Change is coming. His friend Marine Le Pen is going to be president of France, etc., etc. However, um, actually, in Britain, it's not true. Uh, populism in Britain, or, or Brexit, certainly includes all sorts of pretty mainstream things. And the bottom line is, the British have never really much liked the European Union. In 1983, 56% of us said we hadn't benefited in any way from being a member, having voted to stay in in the last decade. By 2011, it's still 54%. Our relationship with Europe has always been entirely transactional and not emotional. And it's always been fairly fine, finely balanced, and it's always been swung by the arguments. So anti-Europeanism, you know, and, and that sort of surge is, is not something new. It just took, actually took form at the voting booth. And actually immigration, of course, since polling began in Britain on this subject in the 1960s, we have always said that there are too many immigrants, regardless of the actual numbers. And hello, Joe. And voters of all parties have always said that they aren't happy with the way the government is dealing with Brexit, we're sorry, of immigration, whether they're Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, or indeed UKIP. And of course, voters of all parties very concerned about immigration long before uh, talk of an EU referendum was raised. And actually, I th and I think this is what, when we're looking for patterns, and I think this is the challenge, as human beings, we're all subject to confirmation. You know, we want, we want to look for patterns. So we see, we see Brexit, we see Trump talking about Brexit, we see an anti-establishment figure winning, and then we start to concoct a massive story. But actually, in both Britain and America, I think, chance still played a huge part. If Ed Miliband hadn't changed the voting rules inside the Labour Party, we might have had a different leader of the Labour Party than Jeremy Corbyn, who, despite his many merits and strengths, uh, was unlikely to uh, swing a campaign in favour of Remain. If one of the other candidates had won, it's quite possible that we would have gone from 51.8% leave down to a different figure. Again, the Leave campaign admit that they had a number of lucky breaks during the campaign. They settled on a clear slogan, take back control, Remain. The campaign was appalling. All sorts of very, you know, lots of arguments from experts and the elite about money you might lose. The arguments, as we know, didn't cut through. Most people didn't believe any of those messages about their standard of living being affected. They did believe messages about uh, our friends in Turkey being immediately allowed in and fast-tracked to membership. Um, so the campaign was very weak. All of these things together fall into place, and we have history, which, of course, is comprised of, as one of our former prime minister puts it, events, dear boy, events. Now, that's not to say that there aren't the currents that Brexit and Trump reveal are not there, but there are, it is not necessarily a surge sweeping across the world. And Britain, <coughs> fundamentally, remains more shopkeeper than revolutionary. When you look at the report, which is on our website, when we're looking at these dozens and dozens of questions on attitudes towards strong leadership or keeping out foreigners, Britain actually, 
as usual, is fairly middle of the road. The French, as Henri will discuss in a minute, quite like strong leaders. Interestingly, the Germans don't. Um, but the British, we're sort of just mid-table. We're just sort of mid-table. And actually, we've recognised that our country, our little island, is about trade um, and services, spreading things around the world. And actually, who's going to win in all of this? Not UKIP. We'll see what happens in a couple of by-elections, but even if UKIP win both by-elections, I'm not even going to make any predictions about those because I haven't done any polling in them, but even if they do, there is very little relationship between what happens in by-elections and what happens in general elections. And ultimately, it looks like the main ruling party, the Conservatives, are going to be carrying on for some time uh, the end. Populism, goodbye. <laughs>